Dear all the laundry listeners, we are back in the studio and today we are going to look at not only AML, but also how it fits together with fraud and cyber. This is an episode that explores where the synergies are and what it means. And with me today, I have both Magnus and Frederick. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Magnus, Magnus, let's just kick it off. Why is it so important that we talk about integration of fraud, financial crime and cyber? I think there's many reasons, right? But I think the one key reasons that we see is that many of the largest attacks really have been made possible by criminals leveraging both the fraud, AML, and cyberspace. And and you probably heard about the Kubernetes attack, right? Who is like the biggest one. Uh, and I just want to shoot in for those of you who haven't heard about this attack. Uh, it was actually an organized attack on multiple banks. I believe over 40 different banks over a time span of five years where the criminals leveraged the fact that banks historically have been very siloed in their risk management units. And in that way, they were uh, able to leverage uh, malware that could infiltrate the bank um, and also, you know, sneak, uh, go through the hoops and go undetected. Yeah, I, th I think it's exactly that that really illustrates the point of why these financial crime units should be integrated. Um, and I think it's no longer the case that it's only the most complex and most knowledgeable criminals that may, might be in organized crime units that really perform these types of cross-cutting uh, cross incidents or cross-cutting heists, right? So as long as the cyber knowledge increases among, let's say, the general fraudster, this is becoming increasingly more important for banks to really close these gaps that that attack actually showed us how critical it is to collaborate within a bank. Yeah, because the Karabinak attack was kind of exceptional because it was criminal, like organized criminals and over a time span of five years, and they were actually able to uh, withdraw over a billion dollars in cash. But what you're saying now is that this knowledge it's not only for the big organized criminals that has a lot of resources, but it's, that knowledge is becoming more and more available for, you know, the everyday fraudsters. Is that right, Magnus? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, this example of the, of the, of the five-year heist, right, this is very, it's unique. Uh, but, but for instance, they actually managed to uh, transfer funds into AT ATMs that automatically withdraw those account, that, that cash into waiting Comp uh, waiting criminals, right? So it, it just almost taken straight from movie. I even think it became a movie, which which explains a lot. But I think the really the crucial element that this attack showed was that the historically, let's say, in point controls that are focused on a specific type of incidents in a specific channel of the bank is no longer enough to stop coordinated attacks. And that shows these gaps how big they actually can be if not addressed. So it's important to break down the silos. Yeah, I, th I think so. There's you can say that there's two elements. So, so one is breaking down the silos, which basically means that the financial crimes units must be much more closer together and much more, um, much more aligned in terms of how they perform and what they control. So it's not only enough to control for AML, you also have to control this against fraud risk and cyber risk. And then the other thing is, that, of course, that the design, let's say the control design today, where you maybe have a rule or a system or some glitch that you try to avoid, that's not really enough. You also need to look at this like historically and also forward looking in terms of where would this money go next, right? Which is really this carbon attack really showed us. So that, that's for me, like that's why you need to think about integration and not only having different, let's say, risks treated very differently. So Frederick, you've also been out in a lot of banks uh, and seen how they, uh, how they operate. Have you observed any sort of silos that you think poses a, like a big uh, risk? Yeah, no, definitely. I've, uh, I've absolutely watched a few. I think one of the most uh, comical slash tragical ones was, uh, was a bank where, where they kept kicking out the same client over and over again, but the client just kept applying for, uh, for the same, uh, to the same bank and accept it over and over again as well. And that was because the, the system and the team responsible for disqualifying and kicking this client out was not 
at all speaking to the system and the team approving and doing the onboarding. And it's uh, it's interesting because luckily I feel like that that sort of level of scrutiny, no, not scrutiny, but that level of uh, system failure is a bit of the past, but it's definitely a long way to go still on, on that aspect. <laughs> I think it must be, it's almost like the light bulb approach. If you try 5,000 times on how to launder your cash, you might like get one lucky shot, which you can start exploiting over and over again. Of course, it's very, it's very easy to say like that. That's funny, right? But I think if a criminal can re-enter, reapply, re-leverage, or being kicked out one place in the bank and then become a corporate customer and then go away again and become a personal customer. All of these things really, uh, it's all about like, do I really have a 360 coverage of where my clients are at any given time? So that was one example of a process gone horribly wrong or cross team collaboration and gone horribly wrong. But uh, do you have any examples of where it's gone well or a stellar example of a good cross team collaboration? Well, there's, there's plenty of examples, but luckily, like this as a problem is luckily no longer the case in most places. Um, like the point Magnus is making from a single channel focus, it's certainly still a problem, but from a technology perspective, it really shouldn't be. If you look at marketing and sales systems as an example, it's not long since this was separated units in a company. But sales and marketing these days, they work together just fine. And they need the same data because they work together towards the common goal as well. So as an example, if you ever join the webinar and a few days later, you got a phone from a sales rep, that's because the marketing team viewing the webinar, they know that there's intent that they then communicate to the sales team and the sales team actions that uh, that intent uh, for great timing and opportunity. Because as it is with sales, it's all about intent, timing, and opportunity. And if you look at fraud or AML as well, it's all about intent, timing, and opportunity. So there's just so many places within the organization where you can uh, where, where you can look and see how did they do it back then in terms of just operationalizing, getting system support that's not single channel one point, but that works across different departments that has the same goal in mind, which obviously AML, cyber, and, and fraud has, has as well. What's your comment to that, uh, Magnus? I think it's a good analogy to use uh, like how se- like sales and marketing and towards fraud, cyber, AML. It is yeah. kind of good, actually. Yeah, absolutely, right? I think that you, have the, you, you want to understand your customers in both places. One is like, how do I understand it from a, from a criminal point of view, right? But also, how do I understand the customer for to sell more and, and get them more engaged in my products? But But I think... Like if you take that analogy, right? Then we say, okay, we have sales and marketing, and we have email and fraud. But but what is the common? What is like the, the denominator? That, that like what is common between cyber fraud and email, then, right? And and for me, I would say three things, right? It's the identification part, like who's my customer. It's the monitoring part, like the transactions type of things, and then it's also the reaction, right, or the response to this. And and these three things, like that, that's what make it common. That's why it makes it integrate and make possible to integrate. So how do you integrate it? Because banks have a lot of systems, a lot of legacy systems. It's you know heavily regulated, so it's not that easy to just rip something out and replace it with uh, something else. How would you actually go about doing it? Yeah, so so for me, I'm very happy that I can talk about it here instead of actually doing it afterwards, right? Uh, but but taking it a bit from a like feasibility perspective, right? So starting with the first one, identification, right? It's all about like, okay, who is my customer? Uh, from a financial crime perspective, you want to do your client risk rating, you want to do your due diligence on that customer, right? You have very clear things that you must do to identify and understand it. But but the same is for fraud, right? You want to verify their identity, both like digital and non-digital. And then for cyber, you want to make sure that both uh, that the credential they use are used at the right place and at the right time and by the right person. And it's all really about identification, which I think you, Frederick, also have seen like, in, in terms of the platform you are backing, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, getting, getting just a granular exposure of data to, to make sure that you have the proper uh, identification is, uh, is obviously a time-consuming task in and of itself. It's not enough with a client sending over some credentials, uh, you actually need to verify this. So it's a time consuming task, but luckily like there's a lot of system support to really 
help out with all three aspects of this that could be used as you mentioned like with fraud aml as well as uh, cyber at, at these days yeah and then, and then you can say okay what would the integrative solution look like right it would basically be that you have risk scoring which is much more rich using both the cyber fraud and financial crime perspectives that gives you one single risk scoring of that customer used across these divisions or teams right but that's easy for us to sit here and talk about and but actually taking all this data which is in various different formats combining it making use of it it does require forward-looking systems or systems yeah. that are inherently built on AI. You can't necessarily expect this from a legacy system that was built on a database architecture many years ago. So it, no, this I, also requires like willingness to invest in like new technology and taking that risk. Yeah, and also it's the willing to actually do the integration, right? Because you can choose to, you can choose multiple different, let's say, operating model, all the way from being completely decentralized and siloed, right? To the, through being, let's say, partial integrator or, or collaboration, right? Like same risk assessment process, same taxonomy, etc. But then also you can choose to be fully centralized where you have the same framework, the same assets, you assess it in the same way, but that's really where the banks are deciding, okay, should we take that big step today or should we maintain on collaboration? That's the most of the topics. And it's interesting because from a compliance perspective, like they they need to fill out different types of compliance checklists depart, depending on which department they're actually uh, situated in. So as an example for a KYC checklist, it would be different than from a cyber security threat list, uh, checklist, I mean. So this means if you have a centralized one, then you probably end up doing a lot of checks that you don't necessarily need to do for your specific compliance, uh, compliance uh, checkpoints. Yeah, of course, but I think there's like simpler things that you can do as well, right? So, so integration is not only about like say the systems and everything, but it's also about like the terminology we use, the risk we assess, uh, the appetite we have for those risks, and also how we we, we per perform the risk assessment on those risks. Right? Every all of these things can be aligned, let's say, from a supporting mechanism perspective. But then, of course, if you want to make this into let's say a tool or have it like all the perspectives in say, stored in one place, then of course it becomes difficult, but integration doesn't have to be so complex if you just start on the actual enablers you have, let's say the risk taxonomy, for instance. Now, I was, just, I was, I was supposed to move into transactions now, right? But, but I think we can, we can do the same breakdown for transactions and response as well. Uh, and, and the question mm -hmm. will always be like, how far should we pull um, the, let's say, push for central uh, management of financial crime. But uh, so when you talk about, you know, if we go for the fully integrated approach, the first step is not necessarily to start in the end of like technical integrations, but start in just let's make sure we all talk the same language here. Make sure yeah. we agree on the vocabulary across departments. That would Absolutely. be like an easy first step. Absolutely. I, th I think you need to think about this as, as, a, as a change project. So, so first you need to define like, what do I want my target operating model to be? where you need to choose like which archetype should I go with? Like and that's really like, should I collaborate? Should I not collaborate and be, and be siloed? Or should I actually be fully integrated, right? That's the first, let's say, design decision. And then but the I guess, uh, have you seen anyone that goes for the non-integrated approach? I guess the natural like decision that banks or financial institutions needs to make, it's just from like fully integrated to somewhat integrated. Like you wouldn't go from the iso the siloed approach because the attacks, as we've seen, they show that it's a lot of loopholes that the criminals yeah. can get through. So you wouldn't go that way, right? Uh, no, that, that, that that's of course true, right? But but if you look internationally, most banks are at the stage of partial integration. But if you look, let, look locally, let's say in Norway, uh, the regulators are, are formally like recognizing or mostly trained to look at the siloed approach. So, so it's also about pushing the needle in terms of what is allowed and what is expected from, from regulators. And then, of course, from the bank's perspective, the efficiency gains will be, uh, will be huge from, from doing this centralization. But it's also mm. about the comfort and, and the way of working, which is very is also about the culture part, right? The way we work, the organization. Do you think it's the same, like the Nordic regulators approach is different from like the rest of Europe? Um, I don't think it's different per se, but I think I think the experience of regulators, let's say in the US or in the UK, and the resources they have available to be to take on the supervisory role is very different than the Nordics, right? 
But but at the same time, let's say Sweden, I think they're quite advanced and, and quite ahead, right? Because they've had a lot of, let's say, training recently, <laughs> put it like that. But but that's not the case, let's say, in Norway. Okay, so I think like we talked about identification, right? And we see that there's potential for integration because of the similarities, and we know it's challenging, right? But I think the same is for transactions, because in transactions, you have... You have the payment screening, you have the transaction monitoring, right? And you have the name screening, which ties back to the identity. But then you also have for fraud, you also have transaction monitoring. You have fraud analytics and engines that looks for fraud, right? And then for cyber, you also have similar, right? Because you have the SOC that you have to do. You have the you have everything like, how does this uh, monitoring solutions actually work? And how safe are them? Uh, and how good are these controls? Uh, and all of these things can be tied together to, let's say, the risk assessment of the specific transaction. So that's also mm. one element of integration, right? I'm not sure what you think about that, but that's my perspective. This is a huge area. Mm. There's a lot of systems running in parallel, huge integrations that are being maintained, big budgets, but uh, yeah, running parallel, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Frederick, I think we, me and you once discussed that it's like the legacy issues are enormous in this space, right? Yeah, no, <clears throat> absolutely. It's... Uh... It just seems like the cost of, of uh, making sure that everything gets rebuilt from scra- scratch is just way too big for somebody to bear at, at this moment. But I do think, like, luckily with modern day third party su- support systems, that's actually designed and built with that in mind. They're able to tie these together, like, basically layering on top, making sure that all systems speak together to get a, a common end goal, uh, a common end result for everyone. Yeah. But, but I also want to take, like, the, the perspective of it's not that difficult to start, but it's very difficult to finish because there's so much you can do. But, but so if you mm. take the, the easiest level of integration here would be that you, you allow transparency on what is being, what, what is the fraud incidents with, let's say the transaction monitoring analytics team or those that are calibrating models, right? To have that cross sharing of information, like that's really the first step. And then also organizationally, like how can you foster the collaboration between these teams, like basically on terms of experience. Uh, all the legacy issues, like how did fraud solve it compared to transaction monitoring? Because the cool thing about the fraud engines, right, is that they don't have the same regulatory Mm. scrutiny from expectations and stuff like that. So they can explore much more, be much more creative, create all the cool stuff, right? While the transaction monitoring team spend just as much as time proofing and showing that their models work, right? So there's a lot of like also system, like considerations here from that point of view. Yeah, very, yeah, very soon we're going to make a special episode on uh, the, the use of AI in oh, wow. these type of technologies as well and understand why it's not really straightforward and what's the problem with black box technology within AML. Yeah, I think this is the area where I've gotten the most like in the trenches story, you know, transaction monitoring. But yeah. uh, let's see what we are able to get on record because that is a different, uh, yeah. that's a different thing than hearing it. Mm. But then I think like this all the transaction, all of the transaction also ties back to let's say the, the response, right? So so I think it's not only connected by, by risk type; it's also connected from and from a value chain perspective. But uh, but if you take financial crime in terms of response, you have the SAR, you have the decision to do not bank with certain customers, right? You have all these elements, and then on fraud, you have the investigation and resolution teams for a fraud incident, right? Um, and and even though. This might seem different, but the, the value from an, or in, insight from an investigation or resolution team in fraud can leverage the insight from SARS and the do not bank decisions. And then, of course, you can also then have the forensic teams that does on, in, in cyber can also leverage that information on where the cyber breaches were, uh, were mostly affected, let's say, from their bank perspective. So have, have you ever experienced... So, sorry, uh, just just jumping in with one sort of important uh, perspective on, on this one or an important question. Have you seen uh, any sort of uh, scrutiny slash problems with data sharing on this between different departments? Like uh, as an example, uh, some workers in bank, they can't see if people are under uh, investigation yeah. or if it's enhanced due diligence. So have you seen some some examples of this limiting the amount of sharing that they can do? Yeah, I think, so if you look at the banks, right, there's like this this notion that uh, a person that are under investigation for uh, money laundering should not know that that person is under investigation of money laundering, right? 
but this does not inhibit, let's say, a common analytical uh, analytics team. Let's say you have a shared analytics team or a center of excellence uh, data center, whatever they, they call it, right? To leverage insight from previously closed cases or SAR cases that already been investigated by the bank to the to the FIU units. And so, so for me, data sharing should not be used as an excuse because you're going to work around it. Mm. Interesting. And that's my personal perspective, of course. So we've talked a lot about different things, but if we were to give, if someone then chooses to go for an uh, uh, integration, inter integration of cyber AML fraud and are currently in the siloed version, what are the sort of top three tips we would give them to get started? easy low the lowest hanging fruits very tangible like what could you do already today yeah maybe what I would can, your I, tips be magnus yeah so my three tips for that would be to to kick start your integration one align the frameworks and risk assessment uh, risk taxonomy that you use to have the same understanding of the risk exposure and which risk i have secondly i would start um, creating forums and foster collaboration between fraud and AML, right? And then three, I would increase the cyber knowledge within the analytics team that only works with models to ensure that you actually start to capture the extent of the cyber insight and cyber, let's say, forensic results that the bank has. That's like the three low-hanging fruit, but the one first one is really the most important one, the frameworks. Yeah, and this can be done without, like, you don't have to code to start doing this. You don't have to start an IT project. This is all about just aligning your people on the same sort of, uh, yeah, on the same level. Right, it's literally taking the risk taxonomies of fraud, AML, and cyber, putting it in Excel and remove duplicates and see if you need mm. all the risks that are left, right? To put it that mm. easy, right? That's, so that's basically really mapping, out, mapping out data points that you acquire in each process, Removing duplicates, go from three systems to two systems, from two systems to one system. Maybe create a task force as well within the banks that's cross-department to make sure they have the overarching responsibility and overview of the project and get started. Yes. And then once you have an aligned, let's say, they have 25 risk types that I'm, that I'm supposed to look at, you need to align the risk appetite between fraud, AML, and cyber, right? So that everyone knows where does my appetite stop and start. And then once you have that, right, you do. <laughs> so we can talk about like really operational specific stuff here. But uh, I think that the, the key message is that you can start with the easy things and then you need to put in the backlog of all the IT stuff that will come with it. But that's not really what blockages you. It's what, he, he, it's what keeps you from finishing. So if we were to summarize today's episode, it's basically that there's a lot of loopholes in the intersection between AML, fraud, and cyber that needs to be closed up. And doing that, like fully integrated, is a long strategic project, requires technical resources, requires organizational change. And the most low-hanging fruit is actually just to start by aligning your entire organization on the risk taxonomy across these three different departments. Fully agree, absolutely. It would be super interesting to have a guest in the studio at one point that have actually started with this and can tell us about the uh, how, how easy it actually was and how they actually did it. But that's for another time. Thanks everyone for listening to this week's episode. We hope everyone learned something about uh, how to tie these three departments together and looking forward to next time. Thanks guys. Thank you.